management bed. You're listening to Head South Radio with your host, Kat Meyer, a podcast dedicated to prioritizing pleasure and removing the stigma and shame around sex. We're here to be curious and have an open conversation about sexual health and relational wellness. This podcast is intended for educational and entertainment purposes. The information discussed is not a substitute for professional medical advice. Hi, I'm your host, Kat Meyer. I'm really excited to share the inaugural episode of Head South Radio. Our first guest is Deb Valentin. She is the founder of Sage Wellness, a holistic acupuncture and Chinese herbal medicine health practice located in downtown Manhattan. With over 17 years in clinical practice, she is dedicated, intuitive, and compassionate in helping others in their quest for health. Her practice specializes in women's health, fertility, and reproductive education. I learned a lot from this chat with Deb, and I hope you will too. Thank you so much for joining me on Head South Radio. I'm really excited for you to be here. I have a very deep connection with you through my own um, health and wellness journey. And it meant a lot to me um, during that time. It was about five, six years ago we met yeah. and we were together. And um, I'm, it's such an honor to have you on here. You were one of the first people I thought of when I wanted to do this podcast to talk about sexual health, reproductive health, um, just human health, really and truly and relational wellness. So uh, thank you for joining me. Um, oh, you're so welcome. I'm so grateful. If you wouldn't mind, Deb, just giving us a little background on who you are, your practice with Sage Wellness, and then um, we'll jump into the subject matter at hand. Great. Um, I'm Deb Valentine. I'm the founder of Sage Wellness Acupuncture and Herbs. Um, we're a women's health and fertility pra- boutique practice, I like to say, in Lower Manhattan. And so we treat um, women and girls and young women of all ages throughout all kind of reproductive health issues in their lifespan. And then um, we we briefly discussed before uh, the podcast about sex education, and that's mm-hmm. something I'm very passionate about. And you recently wrote a newsletter that I found very inspiring. Um, so one of the things I want to discuss is fertility awareness, because it's I I don't intend on having children, but a lot of my girlfriends, I'm of the age now I'm 38. So a lot of people in my life are between the ages of 30 and 40 and they're women going through this process. So if you, um, I would love to hear your thoughts on fertility awareness and education. Yeah. I love this topic and I thought it'd be kind of fun to dive into a little bit of history uh, within this to kind of bring up to the point of fertility awareness in our country. And so I did some fun um, I love history and I love stories and I wanted to understand, you know, in my practice, the reason I, I am passionate about fertility awareness in my practice, I deal with so many women that come to me to get pregnant and oftentimes they're going off the pill or, um, the, the, a lot of the majority of them, or they're just, okay, they're, they want to start conceiving and it's pretty amazing. I do a lot of education in my practice to very educated women. And it's like, wow, a lot of most of my patients really do not know their own bodies and the signs and symptoms of their own fertility of, you know, the signs and symptoms of the changes that take place during ovulation or the most important timing, you know, for when to get pregnant or how long sperm lasts or what their menstrual cycle is. And for the most part, that women actually thought they were getting their period on the birth control when it really wasn't their period. And I deal with a lot of women that go off the birth control and they're not getting a period or it's irregular and not to bash the birth control at all. I'm going to go into the history of that, but more so it always would, you know, after 17 years of practice, I'm like, it, the question would raise a lot in my head of where, where's the education in this? Like all of a sudden they're in their twenties, thirties, early forties, and I'm sitting down with these women and really educating them about their menstrual cycle, the most natural part of humanity and being a woman. And so then that would come to the point of, you know, that would raise a question in my head, well, where is this education coming from? Mm -hmm. And is there sex, is it sex education? Is it schools or is it parents or doctors that really should be informing these young women when they're getting their periods? And then furthermore, when they're having intercourse of their fertility awareness Mm -hmm. and not about sex education. So I've been very passionate about it. And I wrote this newsletter, I don't know, a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And I look at my assistant, Jasmine, I'm like, you know, it's something I'm really passionate about, but I don't know if people are going to read this. And it was fascinating to see, I got the most responses 
um, for my female patients on this. And so, and they were really passionate about it and really were like, I love this newsletter. So I dug a little deeper into this question of who is responsible, who is supposed to be raising fertility awareness within our youth, you know, young women and men of, of ages where they are having sex, and they're beginning to explore, you mm-hmm. know, sex. Another coincidental thing that I became very passionate about was the birth control pill. And I'm like, where's the education also in that? And again, not, not negating it. It's just, there's not a lot of education in what it does, um, why you're not really getting your period. And when, you know, you were younger and to balance hormones and to um, regulate your cycle or to treat acne or to treat painful menses, women were just given the pill or not to get pregnant. And then years later, they had no idea that, oh my gosh, that was not really my period. Yep. And so I don't actually know my body and the cycle when you, when you come off, because I, I had, I was probably 17 when I went on it and mm-hmm. then got off of it about 27, 28, because I didn't like how I was feeling. And around oh. 20 is when I learned how to do a calendar method. And then more recently, I've started using temperature method as well as calendar, like both. That came from girlfriends educating me as an adult and not knowing that that's, that's the cycle. And that's how we can manage, not even just manage our birth control, but manage a lot of things in our life and how we can like prepare for the different parts of the cycle and eat and function and even exercise like my exercise routine is now I have a deeper understanding of my cycle. And I think there's so much ignorance around it because it's not taught. Um, And so I love that this is a, a, it makes so much sense to me that that is what uh, you had a big response from, because I think there's so many women looking for that information and only now finding it. And I'm of that generation that was a generation that was put on the pill, regardless of whether it was for birth control or not. It was like, oh, I have really bad cramps pill. Like it was just kind of the thing that was just readily available at any moment. And now I'm of the generation that's trying to str- like struggling through and trying to understand their bodies and getting into wellness, but also trying to get pregnant and not understanding what's going on. And then immediately yeah. turning to other alternate like IVF and things. And I'm sure you have some thoughts on that, but it's, there's, it, there's so much lack of understanding and education. Yeah. And I love that you're doing this podcast to build awareness around that. And so I wanted to briefly speak because I thought it was really cool and fun to talk about, you know, the history of contraception and the birth control in our country mm-hmm. um, and also kind of the world. So I kind of delved back into history and it's fascinating because, you know, birth control was, I mean, if you go back years and centuries, it's, you know, the first recorded um, was in ancient Egypt and there was, yeah, they had a mix of honey and uh, acacia leaves um, to block sperm. So there was a lot of spermicide methods that were used in ancient Egypt, in India, and in, in Persia. Um, and it was also interesting to kind of research this because in medieval Europe, any form of methods to block pregnancy were deemed immoral. Yeah. And so while you have this, these Europeans that came to our country with this basis of religious um, ideas that, you know, this is immoral. And so I think really subconsciously, we already know, okay, our grandparents and our parents that grew up and even before that grew up in an environment, well, first of all, you had a lot of kids when, you know, our great, my great grandmother, I think had nine kids. Mm -hmm. Um, That was just part of you, you bred a lot of children. And then I think secondly, the idea of, you know, getting pregnant or the idea of any education around that was really not talked about in the household. And I look back and I had a wonderful mom and wonderful childhood, but my first experience with the period is first of all, I thought I pooped in my pants. I probably was 11 or 12. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I'm stressed out. And I go to my mom, I'm like, I pooped in my pants. I think I had diarrhea. And she literally was smoking in her bathroom, opens the door. She's like, oh, you have your period. And she says, hold on, hands me a pad. They closes the bathroom. And I had no idea like what to do. And that was kind of like my experience of, yep. of it was just hilarious. And then I grew up in Catholic school. So the, yeah. the idea of education was, you know, from nuns or, you know, teachers where there was this morality around it. And to be honest, by the time it was taught, pretty much 90% of the girls were having sex. And, you know, we were these rambunctious Catholic school girls that thought, you know, the sex education class was hilarious. So kind of diving back into the history, 
of that. Um, then you have the forming of, you know, the first condom, I think it was in the 1860s and the diaphragm. Mm -hmm. And then Margaret Sanger, who is, if you ever do any research, she, she's so fascinating. So I think back in the uh, early 1900s, um, her mother had 11 children and ended up dying of tuberculosis at 50. And, you know, I don't know if it's from Margaret's idea or if it was true. I mean, she had 11 kids and I think she was just very deficient mm -hmm. from all the childhood. She ended up having seven miscarriages and she died at an early age. Yeah. So Margaret Sanger was irate at 19 years old, seeing her mother pass away and told her father, it's your fault. It's because she had so many kids yeah. and devoted her life to birth control. Going down, she had a birth control clinic in Bronxville, Brooklyn. She was arrested for that. Actually, in 1965, it became in the Supreme Court that actually married couples had the right to their own reproductive privacy and health mm -hmm. um, control. And so the birth control pill was actually um, created or available in 1960 um, by a, I think he was a doctor that dealt with, you know, helped create, which was Gregory Pincus and a, an heiress, and I'm forgetting her name, um, that actually formed the first birth control. And also Margaret Sanger was, did the precursor to development of Planned Parenthood. And so we kind of have, I like, I just thought it'd be fun history facts of where birth control around the world in our country got developed and now it's up. Now we talk about today's times of sex education. And I did a little more research on that. Only 39 states offer sex education courses. Yeah. Um, which is interesting. And in those states, it really is up to the district on how that is actually taught. And so I think a lot of it, I think that this has become uh, a little bit more well, well known in today's times with everything going on with mm -hmm. Roe v. Wade and a lot of, um, you know, sex ed classes depending on each state has become very political. And so I wanted to kind of just give that history um, so we have an understanding kind of the religious morality that has also delved into our sex education. And also 1960, you know, 1965, a constitutional right to actually have a right to birth control was not that long ago. So and access to it only if you had your husband's agreement, like too, it wasn't it wasn't just available for women. It was the husband. It was a married couple. Same thing. Right. The, um, I think it was in the sixties was when women could start getting bank accounts. <laughs> yeah. So it's Which is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It was all during the second wave of the women's rights movement. The first being the early part of the 19th century. So you had kind of the women's right movement, obviously the counterculture, of the sixties that gave rise to now what we see today. It's Planned Parenthood. And now we have different means of birth control, um, which is amazing. And so we have to be grateful as women that we've had people like Margaret Sanger and all these women prior to us that allowed us to have more um, reproductive freedom. However, I think the bigger question to me was always lacking is we might have reproductive freedom, but we're not really having reproductive education and not fertility like awareness, like yeah. none. None. Where does that lie? Does it lie within the schools? Does it lie within doctors? or parents. And if it were up to me, I would say all three, but I know that is a loaded question. Mm -hmm. And I say that also with a lot of empathy that, you know, my dad was a doctor. He just recently retired. And, you know, as a doctor, it's hard to sit down for an hour with a youth, you know, and they have their expenses and they have their things that they also have to worry about. And, you know, schools, well, that also is a political question. Mm -hmm. And then you go to parents and it depends on how we grew up, the cultural, I didn't even go into the cultural backgrounds Absolutely. of, you know, my dad's from the Philippines, my husband's um, Indian of uh, how people were brought up, what their parents were like, where their what their culture was like. And that also dives into this idea of reproductive education. And it goes into sex. And it's just like there's a lot of parents that, like in my household, that just was not talked about. Right. So, you know, as a youth, I've kind of had to figure things out on my own. And I think we shared um, in our past conversation how we kind of went out and we started understanding our cycle. And I don't think that is normal. I think that most of my friends um, didn't. And now I have patients today that, that come to me for basic fertility awareness that I teach in my clinic. Yep. Absolutely. I think there's a lot of um, 
lack of knowledge or lack of communication around it. And like your story of your mother just handing you a pad is very common. And then yeah. the, uh, yes, we d- totally shared that. Like I was driven to want to know more and research more and look at, look up and then share with my friends the information that I was finding when I was seven, 16, 17 and starting to have sex and starting to explore um, and understand um, my body. And I found that a lot of my information is shared through peers. And so yeah. as women, that's we're very lucky to have that because that's, that's a whole nother topic and discussion of like, I don't believe young men have that as a resource either. I don't think their sex education comes from peer-based, very deep conversations and sharing and and they don't have the access, I think, for women, especially because of our cycles and because we have multiple doctors that we see within a year. We do get some more access to that and get some understanding from our doctors. But it is hard. Mm-hmm. It is hard for a doctor to sit down. I actually, um, I think I shared with you that that is how, when I first got my period, my mother took me to the gynecologist who is a, a male doctor. And I sat in his office and talked to him about my period and about my cycle. And then when I was a few years later, ready to have sex, we went back and talked to him about birth control. So I didn't get on birth control immediately, but I had a conversation with him around the birth control options, which was very cool to be able to have that. Amazing. So my mother definitely has more of a, uh, an open, I can have much more of an open conversation around sex and health, seeing a gynecologist and knowing what that process was like. My mother has been very supportive through that. Um, my father is very conservative, <laughs> Irish Catholic, you know, background, but, um, but it, it was really nice to be in a household that had both that my mother was very supportive of, like, I told her I wanted to go on birth control because I was going to be ready to have sex within the next, I think it was like three to six months. I knew my, my boyfriend at the time and I were thinking of going that way. So I told her and like, I wanted to know my birth control options. So she took me to the gynecologist. And I think that that's, it's a really beautiful it, like that, that to me is a very beautiful part of my sexual journey is to have that with my mother and be able to have access to that. Because I know a lot of my girlfriends didn't have that. And I would, you know, pe- some of us would go to Planned Parenthood and get things and supplies for our girlfriends and kind of sneak things and um, plan B and stuff like that. Because of exactly what you were saying, of like culturally within the household, whether a religion or culture kind of dictated what the household experience was like around sex and bodies, even in like the natural parts of us that in some houses it was like no one knew that anyone had any other body parts other than stuff that was shown with clothes you know there was like that those households and then I have you know friends who come in households who like their parents were like nude and people were naked all the time and people were comfortable and talked about you know the natural parts of their body and sex and things so it's it's a wide spectrum and so how do we exactly that question how do we then educate people when everyone is on this broad spectrum of understanding it Exactly. And based on their own backgrounds and based mm-hmm. on like, it's interesting when we spoke in the past, you know, you just brought up like your parents had very different ideas around mm-hmm. sex and, and how open they were to their own children. Mm-hmm. And I think your own story of going to your mom, which is a very safe, I mean, it's such a beautiful story of having the safety of going to your mom and also the maturity you had back then of saying, okay, I wanted to, my boyfriend, and I want to have sex. And you sat down with your doctor. I mean, that's like a story that I never hear. And I think it's a beautiful story of how you've grown up and now you're trying to spread this fertility and reproductive health awareness to the public because being on the other end of it, where I'm a practitioner that's dealing with women trying to conceive, you know, it, it's, it pains me sometimes where I'm just like, wow, like no one ever sat them down or so when I do see younger patients that have been on the pill for a really long time, or they are in relationships, I do take the time and I do talk to them about fertility awareness. Or if I have a patient that's not in relationships and not currently sexually active, I do say, you know, take some time, like six months, don't be on the pill, get to know your cycle. Mm -hmm. And I educate them what it is because it is a beautiful thing. And it is also the most natural thing. We are mammals and we are trying to procreate. And I always tell people the body wants to get pregnant Mm -hmm. and knowing the signs and symptoms of the cervical changes that take place, you know, the discharge and feeling your cervix and what that is and what your period is and, you know, you know, what it should look like or how is it, or is it painful? And also educating women on, on, you know, what is pathological and what we want to treat. And also 
further down the road, I would love to also create a course for actually doctors. You know, I don't blame them. It's a tool, but it is a tool for everything. And with everything, there's moderation and there's, you know, um, the birth control is beautiful in its way and in certain things, but for all means, it's not for everything. If someone has hormonal acne or pain or nausea or cramping around their periods or irregular periods or something, maybe there, there's, you know, that's showing some pathology, or maybe a woman or girl's just getting her period and it takes time to regulate. By all means, those are time, things that do not really need the birth control pill, right? And so I think as a culture, understanding, you know, ways that women or young girls shouldn't be on it, and then also educating girls, young girls and women on their own cycles and reproductive health and when they're fertile, whether they want to get pregnant or not, is really where we have to go to. Because, you know, we could put a condom on a banana all we want. We can talk about STDs and all that stuff, which is very important when we talk about sex. But I think we're missing the fertility awareness and really what our cycle is about and being very proud to be a girl and to own this and to um, such a beautiful thing to be able to do this. And I don't want to just hone in on, you know, young girls and women boys need to know this. Men need to know this. Okay. Like they need to understand a woman's body and conversely, a woman needs to know a man's body. And so just like you did, which I just think is such an incredible thing when young, younger people, you know, say we want to have sex, really what that is about. And you actually going to the doctor is such a mature, responsible thing that I think all kids should be doing or not kids, but young adults. And I would love to, you know, for parents to be more open because it is such a responsibility. We have a license to drink. We need, or we have an age that we can drink, a license where we could drive. But, you know, then we're sending these, you know, young adults out that don't have fertility awareness and are the real proper fertility awareness. And I think that's really important in the next step of our reproductive education in this Absolutely. country. I think a deeper understanding from all genders of what sexual health looks like for everyone, not just for yours. Like go in this room and this is where <laughs> penises go. And this is where vaginas go. Like it, it doesn't, it's like, <laughs> it should not work like that. It should not be a great divide because it's no. not a great divide and having the knowledge and the relational understanding, especially because then you can, you see it in your practice of like younger women wanting to get pregnant coming in. And then I, that was my next question of like, wh- do you actually see their partners? Is there conversations with the partners? Cause I know that like when there's fertility struggles, there is so much focus on the caring parent, but where is the partner and where is their understanding? Cause then sometimes it's not even the caring parents thing it might be the yeah. male partner or the, so where do you see male identifying or well, it's- such a great question because I have to be completely honest with you. And, you know, if you go back into like reproductive education and health and like you look at how it is in our country and what happens when young boys become men mm-hmm. and when these men get married or whatever, or, you know, two, you know, two people, a man and a woman want to conceive. I have to say that most of my patients come in and their, their, their husbands do not or their partners that are male do not. Mm-hmm. Um, even if I say, I, I would like to see your partner, or your husband, This t- it's 50-50, I would probably say, in, still in this country, even though they say 40 or more percent of infertile cases are male factor, <laughs> still in this country, mm-hmm. women are owning it. We're dealing with it, or women are coming and they're they're taking their herbs, daily herbs, they're going for the acupuncture, and they're cutting gluten and dairy and sugar out, and they're doing everything. And then they're getting frustrated because their husband's still smoking or he drinks a lot of alcohol or, you know, his diet's not great. And, you know, so I think he's super stressed at work, all of the things that it's a two, two person journey, but one of the people is carrying They're They're literally trying to carry and they're literally carrying their partner along on this journey. I think I, 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 I feel like that's a lot of the case scenarios that I've seen. And I've w- witnessed a few friends who have gone through that whole thing, changing diet, doing all the things, you know, changing their skincare routine, changing everything that's coming in contact with them, partners doing nothing. And then finally, one doctor or someone will, along the way will say, like, let's test your sperm. And it's mm-hmm. like, why, why is this not both? Why are why are both parties not involved in this entire because fertility, even though one partner is caring, is it's a, a two person 
It's so interesting, right? And going back just within women in this country, right? Like we're working now, we're doing this and that. And it's still, when it comes to fertility and having babies, it's still like this antiquated thing. And it's like, you know, why is this? And it's also a little bit harder, you know, some, some men are great coming in here, really great. But it is harder, I would say, the majority to just get them in. And I think there's more intuition in women and their bodies, you know, and just getting men in and and having conversations around that, not being embarrassed if you have a low libido or if you have poor circulation and you can't sustain an erection or, you know, I think it's a little bit more embarrassing, especially with a female practitioner. Um But that's the next wave. It's just like, and I do think if we can really nip that in the bud at an earlier age Mm -hmm. and really discuss this, and it's funny about, I don't know, a month ago, so my daughter's going to be 11 and, you know, we live in an apartment in Manhattan and we probably have to create another room because I have twins, a boy, a girl. And so we're redesigning our apartment. I keep telling my husband, okay, this is great. This playroom, but let's not get more furniture that we spent a lot of money on because we need, you know, they're going to need separate rooms. And my husband always is just like, uh, you know, just wants to like delay it as much as possible. And finally the other day I was like, she's getting breast buds. Like she's going to get her period in a year, a year and a half. And then we started talking about that and he's just like, oh God. And I told him, I go, you know, by the way, we need to be very, this is, we're the parents. We have to be very open and we're the ones that really have to provide them sexual education and reproductive, you know, fertility awareness. And he was like, oh God. I'm going to leave that up to you. And I could tell he was always sweating bullets. And it was interesting because he's Indian and he's from Dubai and the culture that he was from in that area of the world, you know, you just didn't talk about that stuff. And so it was kind of fascinating to, and I was like, you know, we are responsible. I go, I don't want them learning it from the friends and I really don't want, want, want them learning it through the internet. We're the parents and, you know, we have to sit them down and also make it without judgment or without like, it's just how it is. And I go, the less you put any fear or your own feelings into it, and you're like, Hey, this is for human biological beings. And let's start talking about what that means and what, you know, puberty means and what orgasms mean and what the period means and what, what fertility means in in girls and why this happens around ovulation that you get this discharge and really make it like, we can put, you know, graphs and whiteboards. So it really, it's more coming from a place of rational and not emotional. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's my next step in, in really creating awareness within my children and hopefully creating maybe a course for parents that they can also do that with their kids. And starting at that age, like pre-puberty is an important time to kind of talk about that and have an understanding of bodies and not just their own bodies, but others' bodies. So whether that is when your children grow up and they have partners of opposite sex or even same sex, whatever their relational in their units, their friendships, whoever they are um, in contact with, they have a deeper understanding of what that person <laughs> may be going exactly. through. Very supportive when like I can openly talk to my male friends and say like, I have my period. I don't feel up for like going out and not exactly. feel shame around it. And they understand. So it's not just like my partner knows I have my period or it's, things are going on, but I have open conversations with male friends um yes. of m- multitudes of orientation who understand and like are supportive and be like no take it easy or you know can I get you anything and just a very open loving communication with yes. all of my friends all of the people in my life that's like part of the um uh, mission of head south is not just your own health but just having a deeper empathy and understanding of other people's health so your son and whatever like however he grows up and his relationships and your daughter whoever they interact with in their life they would have a deeper understanding of what those people are going through and just and then that spreads beyond just sex and reproduction it's just understanding what people are going through right as, it's a human thing so i love that you and you're you i love that you're taking the emotion out of it but then yeah. we, we've discussed this of then adding the emotion in when they get to that place of like, now they're going to, they're ready to have sex. So let's talk about pleasure because that pleasure. is her disgust exactly. without judgment. It's like, you know, we are meant to be, we are biological mean, beings meant to, this is a pleasurable thing, mm-hmm. not it should be shamed, you know, 
but what's the end result of that? And, you know, the decisions you make around that. And for women, I also think for girls to have a lot of respect for themselves. And I think that's one thing I want to really, um, part of when I teach my children that is, you know, respect for themselves, respect for the person you're with, you know, also make good decisions around that. And so I think that's a really important thing as well. Yeah, because I think starting it in your household with your husband and your children, it then allows them to have open communication with partners. Because that's I think I think it's like when it's when you're stuck and you don't know how to communicate it, like the family doesn't, then you you become an adult and then you don't know how to communicate that. You don't know how to communicate your needs, your desires. There's shame wow. there, and so then you kind of flop through life trying to figure it out. And hopefully at some point you do. And I hope that for so many people, but it would be so lovely if this could be a thing that starts happening within the family household of like teaching children at every stage of life, not just about, you know, right and wrong and how to be good people, but also how to be good to themselves, how to enjoy pleasure and then how to hold space and share pleasure with somebody else. Cause that's what it is. It's like, I just read that, that like, you know, sex is literally just two people masturbating and like bodies touching but um intimacy is the communication around it and so that's what like an intimacy leads to pleasure and like feeling safe and you can be intimate with a stranger it can be a one-night stand but if you can both communicate and feel and allow like you you will have emotions i think that's so important for people to understand is that you can have a one-night stand or you can have a hookup it doesn't have to be i'm marrying you and you're but any if you were just sex is sex the animals do it they do it they procreate and then go off you know and you can connect and be with the person and communicate and it's all about communication i think and yourself and feeling seen and heard and that starts as children and feeling and being able to express like what's going on with my body what i'm feeling yes and it's very important also i think when you know these young adults go off into college or they go off into the world where you hear one girl got drunk and maybe the guy didn't know, or maybe he thought he had permission, but he didn't. And all this stuff that's come out and which is a scary thing on on both ends. And it's really, I think, building that awareness within both um, girls and boys from the very beginning of intimacy, connection, communication, consent. And- your consent and really you're exactly right it doesn't have to be with someone you're in a relationship with it could be someone that you're in a relationship for that night i do think there's you know so much that we need to further really um educate our youth because i do think our country still even though with 2022 and things on the internet it still is a little backwards when it comes to these deeper meanings and um and education that we really should be giving mm-hmm. our youth and hopefully if we do they grow up making good decisions. They grow up understanding their own fertility and fertility male awareness, both in men and women and boys and girls. And they can grow up with a different generation of understanding around the, you know, the topic. Yeah. And I feel like this is, this conversation is a precipice for that. The more and more I'm um, diving deep into this industry of sexual wellness, I'm seeing more and more of that happening. And so it's just very exciting. And I love the generosity of knowledge, people like yourself sharing expressing and communicating that because it it really is it just takes one little uh pebble in in the water to then spread and ripple and i think that the more and more people talk about this and i have been finding in the year that i've been kind of building up to this is like i'll, I'll meet people at a re- wedding like strangers at a table and they'll say what do you do and i say I'm, I'm starting a sexual wellness brand and podcast and people just want to talk about it it's incredible and so i think the more and more people share and express and this is such a great platform for it of just two people having a conversation around it and it sparks and inspires other people to have conversation around it it's like that's my hope for the future yeah and kudos that's to you it's amazing Thank amazing you. Thank you. So I just had a few more little questions, some wild Absolutely. cards. Someone recently um, mentioned to me that they are finding a lot of, and this is totally my generation because I was of the, like I was 16 when Britney Spears was like, <laughs> maybe mm-hmm. one more time. and so uh, belly button piercings and fertility. Mm-hmm. Do you have any thoughts on this? So my friend who was a Chinese medicine practitioner brought it up and said that he has heard from people who speak specifically work with infertility, that some women who had belly button piercings and still had them and they were trying to get pregnant, Mm -hmm. were having trouble, went through the whole IVF 
process, had a baby, and during that time, removed the belly button ring. And then the second, they had a natural second pregnancy happen very quickly. And mm-hmm. the um, the practitioners were finding it's probably because of this belly button ring kind of blocking, or creating mm-hmm. a disruptor. Um, mm-hmm. Have you had any experience with that of piercings or any type yeah. of? So I always look at it this way. Like there's, you know, probably a certain amount of a huge percentage of women with belly button piercings that get pregnant naturally and no problem. So, but then, you know, in Chinese medicine, we do look at it as you are sticking a piece of metal, which is cold into an energetic pathway, which is the kidneys and the Chong and Ren into, you know, the belly button. So it is not, um, when we look at fertility, it's, it's not really the best thing that you can do, we would say. And it is worth taking out if you're trying to conceive. And then if you kind of look at it just rationally, kind of makes sense, you know? I mean, the mobilical cord comes from a belly button. Like it, it must be some place of, of storage of some of our reproductive health in some way, even if you aren't from a Chinese medical background. And so I kind of think intuitively, it's not the best thing to do um, when you're trying to conceive. And so I can't really say, okay, you take it out, you get pregnant naturally just like that, or say, okay, it completely blocks. I don't really have a lot of women actually that, you know, at that point, they usually have taken it out. But if they haven't, I do say, you know what, I, I think you should be better you take this out than, than have it in when you're trying to conceive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. And then um, this has nothing to do with sex or relationships or um, sexual wellness or reproductive, but is there anything you're listening to podcasts, books you're reading or films that you've recently seen that you've enjoyed that you just want to share? (laughs) I, um, and I, gosh, I don't know the woman's name. It's called the PCOS podcast, Claire, Claire something. I really love her podcast. You don't have to have PCOS to totally like it. If you like women's health or you like fertility, she just, she's so smart. She's a nutritionist and she has a master's in like some type of physio fitness. She's from New Zealand, I want to say. I think she's like so educated and I love how she also educates women about fertility, primarily in PCOS, but just in general, I think she can, you can get so much out of it. So I really, I really enjoy it. It's called the PCOS podcast. You know, in this field, there are so many people out there and I find um, sometimes there's a lot of noise, but she just, she's so super educated and um, well, very well-spoken yeah. on, on the topic. Yeah. And I love people who break through the noise and have like very clear, like, yeah, there's another podcast. Um, the Herbal Womb, which I think I talked to you about. Um, I really like that podcast. Um, you know, I, I know Kayla personally, and that's really great. She talks, her, her whole idea is more about kind of these Western herbs and, you know, womb health. So it come, just comes from reproductive health, whether it's the menses, whether these herbal aphrodisiacs, or so I think that's another fun podcast as yeah. well. Yeah, um, I'm connecting with her uh, in a few weeks, so hopefully she'll be on. Right, she's uh, she's great. She's great. And then, lastly, just to wrap up, what are you working on, and what do you want to? You mentioned workshops and courses and things that. Yeah, so that's the next evolution in my practice. Um, I love educating my patients, and I woke up one day and I'm like, gosh, I just love it. And um, one of the passions is that. So I've kind of dived into online courses. Um, I'm currently working actually on an IVF course and that comes to part. The passion be, you know, of that is I went through IVF with my husband and I, and when you talk about reproductive health and education, it's a long story, but it took, you know, some time to understand his sperm health and, mm-hmm. um, you know, sperm morphology and what it was due to. And at that point we've been trying for so long. So IVF was our next step. I have a beautiful boy and girl twins that are going to be 11. And I, you know, treat a lot of patients going through IVF. And um, through 17 years of practice in my own experience, I do a ton of coaching. I've gained so much experience from my own experience and through patients that I decided to do this course, not only the nuts and bolts of it, but so much more into it, like why the first visit's the most important visit, what kind of questions you should ask, what protocols um, may yield different results, and what do you do with those results, when to change a clinic, when to maybe go to a reproductive immunologist compared to a reproductive endocrinologist. So I decided to create this course for a person that is considering going through IVF, that's really anxious, going through this process to really empower them with the education so they walk in just knowing so much more before going into the process. And then the second fold of that 
course is going to be the preparation for IVF and egg quality. And that's where my background in Chinese medicine and diet and supplements, um, really preparing women and not just saying, okay, let's dive into IVF. It's like, no, there's three months to create sperm, healthy sperm, three months to create a healthy egg. And we have so much that we can influence in our bodies to have better outcomes in the IVF process. So I'm in the midst of doing that. It's um, been awesome. It's been a huge project, but um, you know that that'll probably be coming out in January or March. Oh, that's amazing because I know a lot of people in my life who I, have been, uh, you know, sharing with me that that's the process they're looking into. It they're going to a, you know, a workshop or they're um, they're having they have an appointment coming up. Actually, a good friend of mine has an appointment next week for um, IVF, and so that type of information. I love that it's broken up into the you know thinking about it and what what to expect. And, and then also once you've made the decision, how do you prepare and how do you get through that process and what supports do you need? Yes. Yeah. That. I'm so excited for that for you. Thank you. I'm really excited too. I, I have to be honest. I, I feel like I'm so grateful for IVF and, but at the same time, so much can fall through the cracks and so much women and men don't know. They kind of go in blindly and they're spending so much money that I'm like, this could be better. We could do a better job. And so this is why this course uh, came about. So I'm super excited too. Amazing. And so, yeah, we'll share all of that information on this podcast episode with where you can find Debs, where you can find Sage Wellness and your courses, as well as the podcasts and um, things you recommended throughout. So thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Oh, thank you. You. Yeah, this has been amazing and good luck with everything. I'm so excited for you. And, you know, thank you for all the work you're doing um, you. into this. Enjoy your weekend. It's a beautiful fall day. So um, have you a great too. day. Okay. Bye. Take good care. Bye. Special thanks to all of our guests. Head South is hosted by Kat Meyer, produced by Isis Barlow, edited by Megan Hook, with music by Lily Rezzy Rothman, graphics by Ella Chodos Irvine, cover art by Gina Ship Casey, and intro by Murph Meyer. If you're looking for me.